Have you ever wondered what it is that drives composers to create great masterpieces? In this series, we'll discover how some of the most celebrated works of classical music have been directly forged by the great turning points of history, and how the art, technology, and people that surrounded the composers all left their own indelible imprint on the music. We'll explore the artists, writers, and filmmakers whose own work helped to shape these pieces. And we'll see how advances in science, technology, and industry each played vital roles in the creation of this music. These are the untold stories behind some of the greatest works of classical music. I think if I had to swap lives with a composer, I'd probably plump for the life of Maurice Ravel around about the turn of the 20th century. For Ravel, Paris in the 1900s was really a very lovely place to be. It was a time of great prosperity and, unlike the riffraff in this establishment, the A-list celebs of the day, Picasso, Stravinsky, Diaghilev, Nijinsky, could all be found freely quaffing absinthe and generally mixing in with the hoi polloi in the pavement cafes. The art movement that had swept across Europe was Art Nouveau. Its freely flowing organic forms were new and exciting, and also gave the impression of a world that was very much at ease with itself. The Belle Epoque, as it came to be known, or the Beautiful Age, created a sense of security and gave artists the freedom to escape such dreary details as real life on this planet their subjects often inhabiting timeless, mythical worlds. Added to that, the major powers of Europe were enjoying a well-deserved break from kicking a large smorgasbord of crap out of each other. And a raft of shiny new technology was beginning to make life all the more bearable. It was the age of the dandy. Haute couture was no longer the exclusive preserve of the wealthy, and Ravel, a fastidious dresser who was always immaculately turned out, and who had even refused to go on stage if his collars and cuffs quite literally didn't match, seemed custom-built for it. The music venue of choice was the Salon, in the private homes of the middle classes who could now afford houses with rooms large enough to hold a musical ensemble, as well as a small audience. Much of the music heard in the Salon would be classed nowadays as easy listening, and one dance in particular, the waltz, was enjoying its very own Indian summer. So it seems unusual, therefore, that Ravel, who, after all, was very much a product of his own middle-class, suburban, comfortable upbringing, should only a few years later write one of the most darkly brooding and unsettling orchestral works of the 20th century. And still more unusual, perhaps, the fact that he chose to base this on that most reassuring and nostalgic of dances, the waltz, or to use Ravel's title, La Valse.
truth of the matter is that if you scratch away at the surface of the Belle Epoque, it wasn't all quite as belle as it first seemed. In reality, the world powers were locked in the grip of a headlong arms race and tensions seemed to be mounting inexorably towards the most almighty of fisticuffs. <laughs> Many artists and writers weren't so slow to deal with this dark undercurrent. There was an increasing willingness to suggest that this heady age of innocence was in fact a fragile bubble about to burst. In his short story, Metamorphosis, written in 1915, Franz Kafka tells the tale of Gregor Samsa, a man who wakes up one day to discover he has been transformed into an enormous insect. James Joyce once famously said that history was a nightmare from which he was trying to awaken. Gregor Samsa, on the other hand, wakes up to discover that his real life is the nightmare. Closer to home, Emile Zola in La Sommoir tells the story of a happy couple's life in Paris, devastated by alcohol. In fact, many of Zola's stories focus on a fragile happiness in the Belle Epoque, which is subsequently shattered by the ugly reality of modern living. And as though to spell out the parallel with an increasingly fragmented and disillusioned society, in 1908, George Brack and Pablo Picasso created Cubism, systematically taking apart still lifes and portraits and reassembling them into fragile collections of individual geometric shapes. One of the reasons that La Valse is such an unsettling work is its ambiguity. On the one hand, Ravel hands us a lovely cool glass of pastis, allowing us to wallow in the heady days of the Belle Epoque. But, on the other, he kicks away the support of our deck chair, reminding us that good things don't last forever. La Valse opens with a hazy mist in the lower instruments of the orchestra. Double basses, cellos, harps, timpani and bassoons. And it's almost too easy to draw a parallel between these indistinct murky sounds and the blurred edges and broad brush strokes in the paintings of the Impressionists. We hear isolated snippets of waltz melody bubbling up out of the murky depths. And even when the snippets do become longer, they're distorted, almost drunken versions of waltz melodies. Ravel relies on us to already be familiar with waltz melodies in order to recognize the distortion. It's a little like seeing the caricature of a politician. You need to be familiar with the original in order to appreciate the distortion. This reliance on the composer's and the listener's memory, far more than the blurred outlines, is the key to Ravel's Impressionism. Look at this image of the Houses of Parliament by Claude Monet. The outline of the famous building is barely discernible. The artist assumes that we are already familiar with the Houses of Parliament. In other words, the subject here isn't so much the building as Monet's experience of the building on the day that he chose to paint it. 
The real subject here is Monet the person. By contrast, look at this painting by the mid-19th century French painter Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres. There are no visible brush strokes, the outlines of the model's body are clearly delineated, and there's no sense that we have to guess what it is we are looking at. This is a classic case of art concealing art, and more specifically, of art concealing the artist. Angra the man is nowhere to be seen. Monet's impaired vision, on the other hand, and the mark left by the hairs of his brush on the canvas the day he stood in front of the Houses of Parliament, are a central component of the image he has created. Similarly, Ravel isn't presenting us with a straightforward waltz to which the likes of you and I could get down and have a little shindig. He's giving us his own personal portrait of a waltz based on his memory of a dance form that was disappearing. Nobody could dance to Ravel's waltz. In La Valse, Ravel is watching other people dance a waltz, and the hazy mist, in this case, is not the fog over the Thames, but the fog of his memory, the mists of time, if you like. But there was one category cataclysmic event that makes La Valse especially important. It was an event that not only changed how we listened to La Valse, but an event which changed the world forever. If there was one description that French artists and musicians were very keen to avoid before, during and after the First World War, it wasn't Impressionist, it wasn't Cubist and it wasn't Symbolist. It was German. And the trouble with the waltz was that it was really a very Germanic dance indeed. The waltz was absolutely massive in the 19th century. It was the dance craze that swept across Europe. It was sensuous, it was unrestrained, and it was guaranteed to raise the hackles in each and every horn-rimmed, bespectacled biddy, in whose eyes Mary Whitehouse was but a twinkle. All of which was not very French. The fact that the waltz was originally called the Deutsche or German dance probably didn't help matters either. Just before the war, the poet dramatist and all-round clever clogs Jean Cocteau wrote of the need for French artists to know just how far to go too far. In other words, a French artist was one that was able to show restraint, and Ravel had chosen the least French, most unrestrained of popular dances at a time when the clarion call for French patriotism in the arts was at its loudest. And this despite the fact that Ravel called himself a composer but above all, a French composer. The problem wasn't just that in 1919, when Ravel wrote La Valse, the Germans had been bashing the French for four years. Uh, they'd been bashing them for an awful lot longer than that. In 1870, the Prussian army, for which read 
German army had humiliated the French, nicked an entire province, Lorraine, Alsace, and held a big old knees up on the Champs-Élysées to celebrate. France, it seemed, had nuisance neighbours. Despite the outward appearance of calm, the period leading up to the First World War was a, a pressure cooker of tension between France and Germany. And it was a tension that every now and then bubbled over. Alfred Dreyfus, a promising young Jewish officer in the French army, was a spectacularly unfortunate victim of this bubbling. Wrongly convicted of passing military secrets to the Germans, he was sacked from the French army and packed off to while away his life in prison. As luck would have it, the great French writer Émile Zola was on hand to get him off the hook by writing a deeply critical open letter to the government on the front page of a major national newspaper. Its effect was to sharply and bitterly divide the country for and against the state. When Pablo Picasso, a Spaniard living in Paris, and Georges Braque, a Frenchman living in Paris, cooked up Cubism in 1908, they were absurdly labelled by some critics as Munichois or in the style of Munich, despite neither living or working in Germany, let alone Munich. They were simply marking a break with French tradition, and some people could only interpret that as an anti-French move, and if it was anti-French, it followed that it must be pro-German. All of which is to say, it was a plucky French artist who, after 50 years of squaring up to the Germans and four years of being roundly battered by them, chose to align himself in any way with German culture. But Ravel found himself torn between his love for the German waltz and his love for his home country, France. Before the war, he wrote to a friend saying how much he loved the waltz. You know how much I love those wonderful rhythms, he wrote, and La Valse is certainly a deep and heartfelt expression of his love of the form. When the First World War broke out, Ravel was desperate to join up, but he was rejected time and again due to his feeble constitution and his diminutive height. Finally, after pulling a few strings and telling at least one white lie about his height, Ravel was allowed to enlist and he drove a supply truck to the Western Front, only to be discharged shortly afterwards, having fallen ill. Ravel's war experience was short-lived and nobody could claim that his contribution to the war effort was anything more than slight, but the fact of his involvement in what he called this holy war was immensely important to him. This is what lies at the very heart of what makes Laval such a compelling piece of music. Ravel, the composer who loved the waltz and who had thoroughly absorbed the great Viennese tradition of Johann Strauss II, and Ravel the Frenchman, who did his utmost to play his own small part in bringing about the downfall of the very country that had given birth to the waltz. In 1919, the year that Ravel finished La Valse, a film appeared in cinemas by the French director Abel Gantz. Like Zola's open letter to the French government, it was called J'accuse, and it was profoundly unsettling. It's one of the first great pacifist films, and in a final moving scene, a huge crowd of corpses of slain soldiers rises from their graves to see if the sacrifice they have made has been worthwhile. In a terrible and tragic irony, the extras who took part in the film and who played the risen bodies of the soldiers were themselves soldiers in real life. Following filming, they returned to join their company on the Western Front and nearly all of them were killed shortly after. The whole film is a powerful statement about the futility of war. By calling his film Jacques, Abel Gantz, just like Zola before him, is making a very direct and pointed criticism of his own government. 
He's saying that the First World War had been a, a terrible, costly, and above all, unavoidable mistake. He's advocating dialogue and understanding between nations instead of conflict. Just as Gans in Jacuzzi advocates dialogue and understanding between nations, the great central section of La Valse, in which we hear a series of exquisitely crafted waltzes, is a perfect synthesis of French and German culture. It is a symbol of two conflicting cultures working together, quite literally, in harmony. There's nothing new or shocking about this. The grinding dissonances and the impressionistic clouds of the opening have all gone. This is Ravel in pure homage mode. This is a loving tribute to the great Viennese tradition. In this central section of La Valse, Ravel is falling into step with the prevailing artistic climate of wartime France. He's looking to the past for his inspiration. Influential thinkers like Cocteau called for artists to look to their heritage for inspiration, rather than breaking with the past as the Cubists and Impressionists had done. And artists were encouraged to look towards the 19th century painter Angra as an example of how to do this. Angra called himself a conservator and not an innovator. And in the First World War, Paris was awash with art, poetry and music whose roots could be firmly traced into the past. Pablo Picasso, part chameleon, part opportunist, but absolutely entirely a genius, abruptly changed course. He left aside the harsh innovations of Cubism and adopted a clean representational style of portraiture that was instantly imitated throughout Paris. In this painting, Picasso goes a step further by introducing the well-known characters of the Italian Commedia dell'arte. He's practically spelling out his non-German, pro-French credentials. The French colours, red, white and blue of the foreground, are entirely couched in the Italian red and green of the background. The characters are all Italian, and there is a recognisably Roman aqueduct in the background. The French universe, represented by the blue and white globe in the foreground, is simply a small part of a much larger Latin, that is to say non-German, universe. In this great central section of La Valse, what we hear is a loving tribute to the great Germanic waltz, written in the crystal clear language of French neoclassicism. Not only is this Ravel's tender farewell to a dance form that he knew would disappear with the culture that had given birth to it, it's also one of the earliest and most profound gestures of artistic reconciliation between two countries who, until only the year before, had been bitter enemies. Ravel could have left it there. La Valse could have been a lovely bit of nostalgia and we could all have gone home with a warm glow reminiscing about what a lovely place Europe had been before we all decided to demolish it. Instead, Ravel reintroduces the dark rumblings of the opening. Each time the waltz tries to resume, it is shouted down by loud and discordant elements in the orchestra, and the work takes on an altogether darker hue. It is clear that the happy times are very much under threat.
This idea of lost innocence is one that preoccupied many artists immediately after the First World War. In his novel La Symphonie Pastorale, published in 1919, the same year as Laval's, André Gide tells the story of a blind orphan whose eyesight is restored. The ugly reality of the world is too much for her and, realizing that she can never regain her lost happiness, she commits suicide. In this painting of Harlequin and Piero by André Derain, painted not long after the end of the war, the two clowns go through the motions of happy innocence, but their stringless instruments and their unsmiling, troubled expressions betray them. These are two world-weary actors who have glimpsed a world beyond the comedy and, as a result, seem to be wearing costumes that no longer fit them. Similarly, Ravel doesn't allow us to wallow in the rosy nostalgia of the waltzes. He constantly jolts us into reality, creating an increasingly loud and more discordant atmosphere. Kafka's story, Gregor Samsa remains an insect, and that's a bad thing. Ravel's story, however, has an unexpected and sensational ending, and it is this ending that makes La Valse one of the greatest and most visionary orchestral works of the 20th century. Out of the murky rumblings and harsh dissonances, a short figure emerges, which obsessively, mechanically repeats itself, again and again and again. This little self-replicating theme is a far cry from the long, lyrical, flowing lines of the earlier waltzes. In a few short steps, we have moved from the workshop of a highly skilled craftsman to a conveyor belt in an industrial factory. In our search for fresh inspiration. We cannot overlook the appeal of modern life, said Ravel. And the appeal of modern life for Ravel was very appealing indeed. The cataclysmic destruction wrought by the First World War was made possible by the technological advances of the industrial age. And the irony was that it was this self-same tool, mechanization, which would allow Europe to rebuild itself, but also for humanity to pursue its relentless march through the 20th century. The machine world was something with which artists were becoming increasingly obsessed. This painting by Francis Picabia was painted in 1918, a year before Laval's, and is one of many paintings by Picabia where machines become the subject of portraits. Picabia believed that machines had become the keystone of the modern era and that man had created machine in his own image. It seemed only right, therefore, that machines should be the successor to man as the central subject of portraiture. This isn't a technical drawing or a blueprint for a fantastic machine. This is the direct descendant of the Mona Lisa or Angra's Grand Odalisque. Fernand Leger was one of many artists who were becoming increasingly fascinated by that most mechanical of art forms, film, and he joined forces with the American composer George Antal to produce the abstract film Le Ballet Mécanique, in which image and soundtrack are entirely composed of repeated mechanical processes. It's actually in Ravel's most famous work, Bolero, in which we see the clearest evidence of his obsession with mechanical processes. A single theme is repeated again and again 
and again without variation for the duration of the whole work. Bolero was born in a factory, Ravel wrote. Someday, I would like to play it with the vast industrial works in the background. Ravel was enthralled by mechanization, but he was also equally aware of its potential destructive power. The First World War had illustrated that all too graphically. Drudgery, automation, dehumanization were all potential byproducts of mechanization. In his silent masterpiece, Metropolis, filmed not long after the end of the war, Fritz Lang portrays a futuristic society dependent on an entire underclass of machine workers, in which human beings have numbers instead of names, spend their days in unthinking, faceless drudgery, and in which there is the ever-present threat of wholesale destruction by machines. Both Bolero and Lavals share this destructive element. In Bolero, the unrelenting mechanical repetition reaches an inevitable critical mass, causing the whole structure to collapse in on itself. There's no struggle here between the old and the new, between man and a machine. This is simply a machine that has built up too much steam and which has collapsed under the weight of its own process. Lavals is subtly different. After the mechanical process builds up a seemingly uncontainable pressure, the Viennese waltz makes one final glorious appearance. This is a sumptuous, heroic last stand that is gradually but inexorably suffocated by the frenzy of mechanized processes that overwhelm it. The machine operator has overcome the craftsman. All that is left to do is to deal the fatal blow, and Ravel does this in the starkest and most shocking way. The three-in-a-bar waltz rhythm that is its most identifiable characteristic is killed off, and the entire orchestra hammers out the final bar in four. In these final two catastrophic bars, Ravel has effectively killed off an entire dance form. And such is the devastating effect of the ending that you'd be hard pressed to find a substantial waltz written by a major composer since 1919. La Valse is an extraordinary work. Not only does it chart the incredibly turbulent times in which it was written, it looks Janus-like, back at a lost past, but also forward towards a new future. Ultimately, it's an optimistic work. It reminds us that phoenixes depend on colossal devastation for their existence. It's a loving farewell to a bygone era, but it's also, to borrow the title of a book that would be published a decade later, the joyous, excited anticipation of a brave new world. <laughs>